Okay, so uh, today is the 26th of uh, November, 2021. Why this subject, number eight in architecture? Well, for a very simple and banal uh, reason. Today on the 26th of November, I couldn't find any important or known architect who was born or died. And because I wanted to keep the rhythm of, of, of presentation, of daily presentations, I added the, the number two with number six from the 26th of November, I obtained uh, number eight. So because I, I have a certain uh, you know, attraction towards uh, uh, numbers, uh, certain numbers, uh, I, I felt perhaps I should say something about number eight in architecture. I am far from being an expert. Uh, I, I discovered the RAM, uh, there is a lot of information on the web about number eight, about its symbolism, about its mythology, uh, uh, but I'm not going to go into that because I don't know enough, so I better uh, do not address this part of the subject as perhaps I should. I will just show examples of architecture both from the past and the present where the number eight played uh, uh, an obvious or significant role. Um, so. Uh, Kepler, about whom I made a presentation a few days ago, uh, when it was his birthday, Johannes Kepler said, geometry existed before the creation of things, as eternal as the spirit of God. It is God himself, and he gave him the prototypes for the creation of the world. Well, uh, an exalted statement by, uh, you know, uh, an astronomer, but he was also, uh, you know, uh, exercising himself in the field of astrology. So it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that he invoked spirit and God and so on. He was a different kind of scientist than uh, most scientists today. But then he made this statement in 1619 and he was 25 years old when he wrote this, um, uh, this book. Although God himself delights in the odd number of the Trinity, nonetheless, he unfolds himself profoundly through the quadrinity in all things. This is what Giordano Bruno wrote on the Monas in Hamburg in 1598. Uh, now, this was the, 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 you know, republished, the recent edition in Hamburg from 1991. But he wrote this in 1598. So, uh, you know, quadrinity, this is, uh, this is perhaps worth talking about. I was reading, I read a book by Carl Jung, Psychology and Alchemy, where, you know, he stated that um, a wholeness or a whole is first made through three points, like a, triang a triangle, but, but there are also alchemists or there were alchemists like Maria Profetissima, who thought that actually the, the, the most convincing uh, whole is actually made with four elements or entities or corners or points. And uh, in that sense, uh, number eight uh, relates to, to that kind of whole or, or wholeness. Um, it's, I, I don't have precise knowledge about this, but I have certain intuitions that in a way three plus one meaning four is a feminization of the masculinity of the three of the three uh, triangle is uh, is indeed uh, it forms a whole but it is somehow too uh, self confident and too self enclosed and too astute through its uh, angles so four is a feminization of of what three uh, uh, evokes through what I call its, uh, its masculinity. Again, there is a very rich material about number eight, about there are all kinds of speculations, all kinds of knowledge, all kinds of uh, imaginings about, uh, you know, what number eight meant. And in all cultures, this was also, this happened in Egypt, it happened in China, it was connected with yin and yang, 
there is a very rich material relating to number eight. But in the present, as far as I know, there are no architects who uh, are willing to invest again spirit in a so-called mere number. For us, numbers are prosaic entities. We use them continuously. I actually uh, truly believe we, are, we live in uh, governed by the tyranny of numbers, but numbers lost their mystery, lost their spirit. They, they are just banal. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, in a certain way, the banality of our lives is connected with the banalization of numbers. This was the, the plan. Well, it was re redrawn by that person, uh, you know, A. Sibel in 2009, the plan of the ideal city uh, by uh, Vitruvius. And yes, it is an octagon or octagon. I don't know very well why in English is not said octagon, but octagon. And anyway, it, it is an, uh, 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 clearly an octagon and it, it has eight, eight sides. Why was it an octagon? Well, we'll, we'll see other examples of the octagon. Here we see actually the octagon is connected with the two squares where one is rotated at 45 degrees, like here. And there are all kinds of variations. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was obsessed by the, by the octagon. Many of his sketches um, explicitly or implicitly invoke uh, the octagon. And the question is why? You know, he could have worked with a hexagon. He could have worked with other, you know, uh, geometrical figures. What is fascinating about, about the octagon? Uh, I just launch a question. Uh, this again is, uh, is, uh, is the, the plan of the ideal city of Vitruvius. So, but we'll see that the octagon appears also in the present. Now, San Vitale in Ravenna, the, the very significant architectural uh, uh, you know, presence, uh, if I am to call it so, um, San Vitale in Ravenna is one of the most important uh, architectural achievements. Uh, almost any history of architecture has a picture or two or some text about San Vitale in Ravenna. It is an octagon, as you can see. Uh, and uh, it's, you see, number two, domed uh, octagon. Uh, the octagon, I, I, I don't know. I, maybe I should abstain from, uh, you know, uh, superficial uh, uh, exaltations or to, to just uh, begin to improvise now in a field where there is actually a lot of knowledge. Um, and, and of course, number eight is not the only number that is important. You know, there are other numbers that are more important than, than uh, most of the others. But eight is one of them. Apparently, eight refers to a, a new beginning. Is the first, if we talk of, in terms of the days of creation, which were seven, eight is the first day after the last one, of the seventh one. And it's, it, it, it symbolizes rebirth. Um, it, it is a dynamic number, and it could actually mean both rebirth and uh, uh, regression or, or destruction. Is a complex number, and I really think it deserves um, it deserves study and, and, and attention. Anyway, this is San Vitale in Ravenna, uh, and uh, you know its geometry is uh, is clearly invoking or evoking or uh, describing uh, the power of the octagon. Uh, we are going to see also the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem also on an octagonal plan. Uh, you know, the builders at that time, they didn't play games with geometrical figures or with numbers as we do today. Today, no architect in the world would think about the symbolism or the metaphor or the mythology or the spirit or spirituality of a number, no way. But we live in a desacralized world. Look at the ceiling here, it's an octagon. 
And uh, again, why the octagon? Why not something else? Uh, Brunelleschi, uh, in his uh, splendid, uh, magnificent uh, dome uh, above, um, uh, uh, you know, the, in, in, in Florence, the most uh, important architectural achievement of the Renaissance, also used the octagon, and we are going to arrive at it, at Santa Maria del Fiore. But we are now still at, in Ravenna, and this is the plan again of uh, San Vitale in Ravenna. Uh, this was built, uh, I think, in the seventh century uh, uh, after Christ. I guess the octagon uh, evoked for the people who used it some kind of a uh, imago mundi, you know, an image of the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it had the power to, to, to uh, yes, to evoke. Uh, um, uh, you know, the centrality of the universe, the order of the universe, something again we don't think of at all today, because we are, we are ready to go to Mars, we are going to go to the moon, uh, we are go, uh, ready to do all kinds of things, except to reflect on what it means to be alive on this earth. That we don't do, because it's much easier to to travel for six or eight months in the darkness of a cosmos uh, or space, as we call it, to arrive to a place which has no gravity and, uh, I mean, not sufficient gravity and not sufficient oxygen. Anyway, uh, I, I will stop here with my uh, comments on Homo sapiens. So again, this is San, San Vitale in Ravenna. It's actually from the sixth century. It was under construction in 1520. And uh, yeah, uh, the Dome of the Rock was built in the seventh century, a little bit later after San Vitale in Ravenna. Now, the octagon in Islamic architecture uh, here I am going to show some images of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Here it is, the Dome of the Rock. And let's read a little bit about it. Here you see a, an image, but we'll see more of it. An aerial view of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem from, was built between 687 and 692, so in the seventh century. The first great Islamic is the Dome of the Rock, the first great Islamic building. This was probably, the, I took it from the web and it's possible it was done this material by uh, uh, a student in a hurry. A domed octagon resembling San Vitale in Ravenna, double shelled wooden dome 60 feet across, 60 feet, uh, you know, this is about 20 meters uh, across and 75 feet high. Uh, dominates the elevation as to reduce the octagon to function merely at its base. Tiling now replaces the original mosaic on the exterior, which was vivid, colorful patterning that wraps the walls like a textile is typical of Islamic ornamentation. The interior is rich mosaic ornament, it's rich, uh, the interiors uh, rich mosaic ornament has been preserved and provides insight into how the exterior was once decorated. Um, again, the octagon, and the question is why? Sacred rock where Adam was buried, buried Abraham nearly sacrificed I Isaac, temple of Jerusalem was located and Muhammad ascended to heaven. So we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, sacred rock, which indeed, uh, was and is uh, secret, uh, sacred. Um, this, the, the, the minute ornamentation that can be seen in the exterior is, is better seen at the interior. And Islam was, was wonderful in its ability to, uh, to, to, to cover its buildings with um, very minute and abstract ornamentation. Uh, they didn't uh, like uh, literal representations. They didn't like figuration. Uh, they liked uh, abstractness, and uh, but it's a sensitive abstractness. 
This is a very important, just like San Vitale in, in Ravenna, maybe even more because of the sacred rock uh, here. It's a very important uh, uh, building in, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. So this was built in the seventh century and San Vitale in Ravenna in the sixth century. And yes, its base is octagonal. We are dealing here with buildings which were built at a time when religion and art were not yet divorced. And if we are to believe Rodin, Auguste Rodin and Ingmar Bergman, the great Swedish film director, uh, when art and religion divorced each other, they both died. And this is the time we live in, when religion and art are not any longer together. And actually, even 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, Rodin was complaining that art and religion severe their connection. Uh, look at this. This is also based, but it almost disappears. It's a field within which the octagon is present, but uh, diluted in its uh, explicitness. And I think it's very beautiful because, uh, you know, it, it, the, the labyrinthal character of life is shown in this very fragment of the ornamentation uh, at the Dome of the Rock. There are all kinds of examples of uh, uh, very exquisite ornamentation where the octagon, uh, you see it more explicitly here, <clears throat> is present. So, you know, it's not just the plan of some buildings, but also uh, the ornaments include the ornament over the, the octagon over and over again. Here also we see, well, here is more hexagonal, hexagonal, but, you know, there are transitions between the hexagon to the octo octagon and, uh, you know, I, I, I imagine that these builders did believe in what Giordano Bruno and Johannes Kepler said that you know there was a connection between God and geometry, and uh, I think we can learn from these magnificent builders. That is, if we want to learn. You see here the rotated squares. I mean, it's it's a square rotated, superimposed on another square and rotated at forty five degrees. These, these Islamic builders, actually, they anticipated fractal geometry. Uh, and, um, you know, Mandelbrot perhaps didn't uh, do anything else but reinvent the wheel. You see, again, the octagon here. But there are all kinds of variations based on the octagon, which of course is connected, uh, is based on, on, on number eight. Uh, the, the, the Islamic uh, art of ornamentation is sublime. Now we arrive, at, sorry, I am spelled here is an N, Brunelleschi's dome at Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, which is one of the most significant uh, uh, architectural achievements of the Renaissance and in, in general of the West. Uh, he, this, this building, uh, Santa Maria del Fiore was without um, a covering, so to speak, without the dome for some time until Brunelleschi found the solution how to build it. And uh, it was a very impressive achievement. In fact, so much so that, uh, uh, you know, his colleague, so to speak, uh, a little later, Alberti, thought that the whole, uh, the, the whole population or half of the population of Tuscany, I forgot either half or anyway, it's a metaphor, uh, could find room in the shadow of the big dome, Brunelleschi's dome. It, it, it is a formidable um, construction. And Brunelleschi, uh, found a way which is even now people wonder how he did it. And there are all kinds of studies. I mean, this is immense. I mean, a human being here is like a small insect, is immense. And it is based on the octagon. Again, 
the octagon, the magnificent uh, uh, octagon, which perhaps we should uh, reflect on and uh, receive some, who knows, some, some spiritual impetus uh, to take us out of the banality of our lives. Uh, they look at this. It's, it's magnificent because it is construction, but it is construction which is sublimely uh, beautiful, aesthetical. So a construction or structure becomes, becomes art, becomes uh, beauty, becomes, uh, uh, yes, it transcends uh, the measurableness of, 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 of structure, of itself. Is uh, look at the interior. So we are in Santa Maria del Fiore looking upwards and we see the bottom of the dome built by Brunelleschi. Is the whole cosmos there? You know, is the whole world? Is Dante Alighieri? Is the human comedy and the human tragedy? Is the beginning and the end? Is everything? These people thought in cosmical terms. We are so banal by comparison that I feel sad. Said, said, yes, we have planes, we have satellites, we have all kinds of gadgets and devices, but we despiritualize life dramatically. No, no painter or no architect to do something like this today. No. Why? Because we do not live under the sky, to use Heidegger's words. We forgot to live under the sky. In order to, to, to do something like this, you have to live on the earth, under the sky, and dream about the sky. But we don't do that. And maybe it's not possible. Being in a plane, you cannot conceive of something like this. No human being uh, uh, today would spend a lifetime to paint something like this. Because the question would be, what for? We are too cynical. And on the other hand, it's also true. We have the atomic bomb, right? So. You know, to conceive of this octagonal cosmos, uh, knowing that above it, uh, a bomber like it at Hiroshima or Nagasaki could fly at any time and drop the deadly thing on it, would discourage any effort. I'm not trying to idealize what happened then. Of course, life was difficult then as well. Longevity was not so long as ours. There were many problems, but Look at these people here. Look how, they sm how small they are at the top of the incredible dome based on an octagonal plan that Brunelleschi built. The octagon, number eight. Now we arrive at Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci who didn't build anything I mean, he didn't build a building. Uh, there are some suggestions that he might have contributed to a stair uh, at uh, uh, Chambord uh, when uh, Francois Pre Premier invited him there. But uh, I don't think there are definite uh, proofs in this sense. It's possible. But he made many sketches. In a way, Leonardo da Vinci was the most sublime amateur. Everything he did, he did out of love out of curiosity, he had an immense desire to know. And through his drawings, he was expressing this immense desire. But he was essentially an amateur. Even in his paintings, he used in his frescoes, he used some invention he made. And that's why, you know, the Last Supper is deteriorated or deteriorating in alarming ways. Uh, essentially, he left us a giant amount of, of, of incredible sketches, drawings, studies, uh, and uh, in architecture as well. He also used, this is a, well, it's a recent uh, drawing of a plan of a temple that he, you know, he sketched. We are going to see that, that sketch. Here they are. You see the rotated, the square and the rotated square superimposed on the first one. And, uh, and uh, the isometric uh, view of the building as he saw it on the, on the left. And then here again, we have number eight also, one, two, three, four. And then the, the, the rotation brings other four elements into. Again, 
is number eight, this mysterious number eight. Why was it so fascinating for Leonardo da Vinci? Why? And it wasn't just for him. We are going to see also um, two examples from the present, and I'm sure there are others. But um, I personally think that if, if we can uh, return to some kind of uh, uh, spiritual or spiritualized approach to geometry and to architecture, our, our work will, will benefit, and maybe even our lives. And maybe we will not be tempted to go to Mars or to the moon. Uh, these are recent uh, visualizations based uh, on the, you know, the sketch on the left by uh, Leonardo uh, and the other sketches by him. Most of them based on number eight. You see, even here you have one, two, three, four, and then, you know, the other square. Uh, well, initially was this one and then rotated uh, 45 degrees. So we, we, we see number eight uh, implicitly or explicitly present very often and the octagon uh, in, in his sketches. I, I read about it, uh, the experts say that he was obsessed by the octagon. Well, he didn't make these glasses, but when I searched for the images, I thought of showing, of course, it's an octagon at the top and at the bottom. Anyway, but even his famous Vitruvian man, you know, drawn by, uh, by, by Leonardo, even here we have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Why again number eight? And I think number eight is connected, and I don't know the mathematics behind it, but it's connected uh, subtly with the, with the tensions and the dialectics between the square and the circle, just like we see in this famous uh, drawing uh, uh, by Leonardo. Now, there are in the present also drawings, similar drawings, uh, where the man is replaced by a woman. And maybe, maybe there, there, is a, there is a suggestion towards uh, a different appraisal of what, what is a man. You know, when we say a man, are we referring to both, you know, male and female or man and woman, or we are referring only to man? We only see men here, but uh, I think it's important to bring in the, the feminine side of, 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 of life as well, as much as possible. This is a sketch by, um, by, uh, by Leonardo, again, based on the octagon. Now uh, we arrive at the Louis, uh, Louis Kahn, uh, one of the most important architects of modernity of the 20th century. And we are going to see his work in Dhaka in Bangladesh, where he also used the octagon uh, in the general scheme of the, of, the, of the plan of the building. And this is the capital, is the, the most important political administrative building in Bangladesh. Look at the ceiling. It's, it's, it's based on number eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What happened here was, he couldn't find a solution for this part of the building, the covering, the roof above the, the assembly hall, the most important room in the, in the capital of Dhaka for about two years. And it was a, a war between Pakistan and Bangladesh. And there were bombers, uh, you know, uh, planes flying over Dhaka. And <laughs> luckily they thought that this building was bombed because he didn't have a roof, because Louis Kahn couldn't find the correct um, solution uh, uh, you know, to the problem, how to cover this central space. So they didn't bomb it. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, it's an example where a deficiency uh, becomes uh, uh, you know, a beneficial, uh, uh, beneficial thing. Anyway, it's a beautiful, and you know, this is the second half of the 20th century. But here we see the connection with Leonardo, with uh, everything that preceded. You know, it's, it's, it's a modern work, but it's also connected with a, with a splendid past. And uh, 
you know, this is, I think, very interesting that uh, uh, contemporary, well, almost contemporary architect, well, he died in 1972, I think Louis Kahn or 73, but a modern architect would, would, uh, would, would situate himself on the continuity of cultural creation uh, in, in, uh, in, in modern terms, but still somehow not divorced, not severe from what preceded him. It's a beautiful work, even in the mosque within the, the complex. This is, I hope I have a better picture with this, uh, is here. Even here, uh, so in my opinion, this is one of the, of the most interesting, most creative, and most moving mosques built by modernity. This is again Louis Kahn in Dhaka. And you see the eightness of the world here as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, it's something I, I'm probably not rigorous enough to explain, uh, you know, uh, mathematically or in sufficiently um, lucid terms, the magic of number eight. And indeed, how could you describe anything that is magic or magical in um, you know, uh, objective or lucid terms. Perhaps it is possible. I only have some intuitions that he himself, Khan, was, was seeing the roundness of the world through the eyes, so to speak, of the octagon, of the, the eightness of the world. And the eightness of the world also in, in implies the fourness of the world. Once I took part in an exhibition in Belgrade, in Serbia, uh, called Four, just Four. And, and yes, number four is, 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 is part of number eight and is, is, is evoking the same uh, feminization of, uh, of uh, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. I, I try to, to, to say something in relation with three, with number three, with the triangle, but four, Four also is, is, is uh, you know, present everywhere. You know, the four cardinal points, there is east, west, uh, north and south. There is, uh, there are, you know, four seasons. Uh, there are many, many, uh, many uh, uh, aspects of life that relate to number four. And number eight is the double of number four. And, uh, you know, they are connected. I know I am rather superficial by saying they are connected and not saying more, but I invite to, and I invite myself to, uh, to study more this uh, mysterious, uh, mysterious number. A look at this interior by Louis Kahn. It's, it's an original creation. It's powerful, it's luminous. And it, it refers to, I mean, you know, here we have fragments of the circuit, you know, maybe half of a circuit. But if we add these halves, we obtain perhaps number eight, because the, there, are, there are eight halves. Uh, and um, if we connect them in our mind, because they are not connected explicitly here, we could obtain, in fact, number eight, um, you know, is also uh, almost explicitly, uh, ob uh, explicitly present in the, in those two circles that intersect in, uh, in uh, which, which, which are very frequently found in, in China. Uh, you know, the, the, two, the two circles that uh, intersect, uh, describing or, or, uh, or uh, uh, initiating a, a vesica in between them. This is the building seen from above, uh, a Dhaka by Louis Kahn and uh, the, the roofing that uh, we just talked about is here. I am moved because Bangladesh was and is one of the poorest countries in the world. And yet they have one of the most courageous architectures in the world, thanks to Louis Kahn, whom they commissioned. Neither New the United States didn't commission Louis Kahn as Bangladesh did. The question is why? Well, it's true, they needed prestige, cultural prestige. It, it, was, it was their revenge in a way. You know, they were poor financially, 
but they found revenge in spirit and they had thanks to their collaboration with Louis Kahn uh, uh, an architecture that uh, if you compare the Capitol or in Washington uh, uh, DC uh, with uh, with this you see the difference between a country which aspires to our spirit and aspires towards the cosmos because there are cosmic uh, uh, undertones here uh, or overtones and in 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 in, in washington dc they are completely absent uh, the architecture of the capital in washington dc is a pastiche immensely banal yes big but immensely banal this architecture here is not banal this is the plan this is the mosque the plan of the mosque a little bit rotated because you know the mosque has its own you know uh, orientation uh, uh, restrictions uh, based on mecca uh, is what can we say you know it, it's 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 creativity it's creativity and it's it's uh, it's uh, number 8 was was present in in the making of this building and we see even uh, connections with vitruvius here we saw the plan of the of the ideal city at the beginning of the presentation. This is, uh, you know, uh, uh, far away in time from Vitruvius, but Louis Kahn always wanted to read a volume zero of history. Um, so what does that mean? It means he wanted to, 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 to descend at the very bottom, at the very base of, uh, of inspiration and creativity in architecture. This is a model and the roofing that we saw uh, is, is here. Uh, this was a model of, of, of the structure of the building in, in, in the process of being uh, uh, thought out. So this is, this is the building, the National Assembly building. We end this short uh, uh, you know, presentation on Louis Kahn with a plan sketch from 1963. Uh, and here it is. And, and this sketch moves me too. The octagon is here too, you see it. Very, you know, just suggested. But why again the octagon? Why again number eight? I just asked this question. It's a beautiful sketch showing innocence and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, a mysterious uh, uh, longing for, for some kind of a centrality that would connect perhaps man and God. I think it's about this, actually. And now uh, I'll show another example from uh, very different from Aldo Rossi in Berlin. In the 80s, uh, he was invited together with other important architects to build uh, housing, I mean, blocks of flats. And he, he has a courtyard, which is octagonal. And here it is, a view towards the sky, from the interior of this uh, this courtyard in Berlin, by uh, by Aldo Rossi, it's just one. Although he built uh, several uh, complexes of buildings there, but it's just one. I don't know exactly why he did it so here, but as you can see, the octagon is back or was back. You see, it's here in the plan although he built all these buildings, but only here is this octagonal uh, uh, courtyard. Okay, and now we end this presentation, uh, you know, this incipient, uh, uh, you know, study on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, about a subject which deserves uh, an amplified effort with this eight house, because this was supposed to be about number eight. And big, uh, Bjarke Ingels built an apartment, um, um, well, yeah, an apartment building called eight house it's uh, it's 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 a it's a building which has the shape of number eight 
seen from uh, seen from above. This was not done by Mr. Ingels uh, or by uh, Big. Big is his office, Bjarke Ingels uh, group. But number eight is a very, uh, you know, uh, provocatively uh, illustrated through this uh, older image. Well, is this the mythical snake that eats its own tail? It looks like it. So it might be true that number eight symbolizes a new beginning, but it also could symbolize, um, you know, a regression and, and, and destruction or self-destruction. The Ouroboros in, uh, that um, Carl Jung wrote about in psychology and alchemy, it was, uh, about the same thing, you know, the, the 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 snake that eats its own its own tail. Maybe this is an Uroboros. I don't know. Anyway, this is the building by uh, Bjarke Ingels and uh, and uh, and Big. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. I hope I, I I have a picture from from the air. Uh, I know I have some diagrams uh, from the air, but. Uh, it is like number eight. In fact, very similar to the to the picture with the with the snake biting its own uh, or dragon, whatever it is, biting its own tail. This is a modern complex of buildings, and actually, I'm beginning to reconsider a little bit uh, Bjarke Ingels and Big, because he is also working with spirals and even the labyrinth. And now number eight. You see it, it's number eight. Well, you know, approximated, but sufficiently, um, you know, uh, it's explicit enough to see there are two courtyards. So it's, 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 it's a number eight, and that's why it's called house eight or eight house. What made um, uh, Bjarke Ingels uh, do this building in, in this way? I, I, I don't know, because he could have done it in many ways. You see, there, there was uh, enough space here. He chose to do it in this way, and uh, I'm actually very curious to know why. These are apartments. It's a block of flats, in a way. But um, I think there is more to it, and I'm glad he built it. It is different than the work by Louis Kahn, very different. But this is a good thing. You know, you know, Kahn worked with number eight using the octagon and centrality. Bjarke Ingels works with number eight uh, in, in a very different way, but they both used it. And the rotations between the two squares, which could in a way generate uh, what we call the octagon, uh, the, 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 that rotation is here symbolized through these uh, powerful diagonals. The diagonal, the rebellious diagonal, the one which proclaims life where there is the risk of being something static and thus uh, not sufficiently dynamic. I love diagonals, and, and uh, in my opinion, we need the diagonals badly in life, the rebelliousness of diagonals. Anyway, these are the plants, a little bit too, too light to, to, to be seen uh, in an exciting way, but that's how I found them on Arch Daily. We are approaching the end of this. So it's, it's, you know, a broken uh, number eight and, you know, horizontal, not vertical, but it's still number eight. You see it clearly there, you know, in black. staring at us with its primeval mystery. 
Okay, so this is big, the RK Ingels, and I end this presentation. And now I have another one, which I should have, um, I should have presented yesterday. I don't know if I should, uh, I should present it now. Uh, let me, let me just. Uh, Okay, so I will continue the presentation today with one about Stefano Boeri, who was born on the 25th of uh, November, but not this year, of course, and another architect from the United States born on the same day. But let's talk first about Stefano Boeri, an important archite Italian architect. Um, so Stefano Boeri is an Italian architect, an urban planner. I think he was born in 1956, if I'm not wrong. Yes, you see, born in Milan in 1956 on November 25th, founding partner of Stefano Boeri Architetti. He earned a master's degree in architecture from the Polytechnic University of Milan and a PhD in architecture in 1989 from the Institute of, uh, uh, or University, I don't know, it's, it's the school, the University of Venice. Is the only actually architectural university in it, Italy, the one in Venice. Among the most known projects are the vertical forest, forest in Milan, the Villa Mediterranea in Marseille, and the House of the Sea of La Maddalena. Uh, the vertical forest in Milan. In Milan. Uh, so they, they, they are these two towers here. Now he's building something similar also in, uh, in China. And I think he's even in Albania is building something. So just these two are his that are covered with, with grass, with, uh, with green in Milan. And, uh, you know, yes, his architecture now is very popular because of the, you know, the concern with uh, bringing the green into our buildings and now the forest is climbing the elevations of our buildings in our despair to recuperate some of the lost oxygen. Um, I guess we are, we are, yes, we are forced into this. I'm not very sure that this is, but, but then what can we do? You know, we need, we need the, the trees, the bushes, the grass, we need them. Uh, and now, you know, since the human being, um, attacked nature in increasingly dangerous ways, what can we do? We bring nature back on our balconies, uh, you know, climbing the elevations with what we call vertical forests. But aren't forests supposed to be vertical? I'm not sure about it. Anyway, it's not a, they are not bad buildings and they are done rather skillfully. There are other architects who work in similar ways. But the truth is, we didn't ask the trees what they feel, you know, uh, being planted on, on, uh, on concrete. Um, I once talked with a French architect about this and he said, uh, we know there are studies, uh, you know, science uh, did uh, investigate in what, in, in, you know, how much a tree, uh, you know, is accommodating itself on a balcony and apparently, you know, apparently the, the tree doesn't, does not protest, but I don't know. I don't know, it's something about it, you know. Uh, although, again, what Stefano Boeri did here is one of the best uh, um, architectures that assumed the vertical forest. And uh, I imagine, you know, some beneficial, uh, uh, results of, of this uh, climbing of the of the building with green uh, did result. I like to to think so. I like to hope so, hope so. It's almost a fashion now to do this sort of thing. But he was one of the very first, and he probably, uh, in terms of design, was able to uh, to to create the so-called vertical forest in the most. Uh, you know, pleasing and, and, and convincing way. I imagine these buildings are not very inexpensive, you know, the, the, to bring uh, all that green, uh, you know, uh, 
at, at those heights and on, on all, all those balconies and so on. It, it's an exp expensive enterprise. But what can we do? You know, we, uh, we, raised, uh, we raised the forest and now we bring it back in, in some form. And this is what Stefano Boeri thought of. He built other buildings and we are going to see a few of them. It's not going to be a very large uh, presentation about him, but an introduction to his work. He was also the editor in chief of an important Italian architecture and design magazine, Tomus, for a number of years. He taught uh, a, a very active presence on the Italian uh, uh, scene. So this project is called Vertical Forest. It is in Milan. And uh, it's possible that new such uh, buildings will, will, will be built, not just in Italy, but everywhere. Because yes, uh, we need to fight pollution and uh, we need to fight climate change and so on. I wonder what these trees, you know, on, on Earth think of the brothers and sisters uh, on the on the the elevations of, of this tower, and vice versa. What these trees feel and think of their brothers and sisters on the on the Earth. Of course, I ask a question which is totally non-scientific or objective even, you know, what do you mean? What does a tree think or feel? But, you know, I still belong to the fascination with the magic of the octagon and number eight. And I, I, I like to fantasize that a tree perhaps does have feelings and thoughts, and we just don't know what those are. But I have to say, when I visited um, uh, some years ago, uh, Tivoli, I wanted to see Villa Adriana by the great uh, emperor Adrian, uh, at the, you know, close to Rome. And on my way towards there, I, I came across incredibly dramatic uh, olive trees. I was so fascinated by the olive trees. I had the feeling that they were wise that they were seeing through me, that they were knowing me much better than I knew myself. I filmed them for about two hours. I even forgot about um, Villa Adriana. And I still wonder, what did I see in those trees? Why did I think that they were seeing through me, that they were knowing me? Um, I had the feeling they were very wise. And only later I learned that actually olive trees are some of the oldest trees in the world, that they, 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 uh, they live for a very, very, very long time. Anyway, by the way of trees, I, I love trees. And I think we need more trees in the world, more trees, all for the better. Villa Mediterranean in Marseille. And uh, now there are no trees here. It's an ambitious uh, cantilevered uh, building. Uh, also by uh, Stefano, Stefano Boeri, La Villa Mediterranea is a large public building which houses research, documentation, and projects that concern the contemporary condition of the Mediterranean Sea. The building is located on the docks of the port of Marseille, next to the Museum of Mediterranean History, promoted by the French state in collaboration with the city. Uh, what can I say? Another modern building. It's okay, I guess, but I, I, I don't know if I would uh, evaluate it uh, with more than, than just an okay.
sure, but there is a but here. I think, uh, you know, uh, in Milan, he covered his buildings with a lot of green. Here he uses an extensive surface of, of glass, which is known of, uh, of being very deficient in, in terms of uh, energy consumption. And uh, yet he uses it because, yes, we can because the demagogy of glass turns very few people off, unfortunately. Too much glass in the world, in my opinion. And it's known that when you have large surfaces of glass, there is a lot of loss in terms of energy. Implicitly, it provokes, it amplifies the pollution of the world because then you need the mechanisms to produce energy in order to compensate for the, you know, the, the problems generated by such uh, large surfaces of glass. But we still think the glass is, uh, uh, you know, through its transparency is creating a, a, a union between us and the world. And it's not so, it's just the illusion in my opinion. Anyway, it's, it's an okay building uh, with a little bit of drama, but uh, still, uh, I would say, a rather rationalistic building, which besides this, uh, um, you know, uh, cantilever part is not very surprising in the good sense of the word. Now, the house of the sea, this description provided by the architects, part of the whatever, 1,550,000 square meters recovery and restructuring project aim at creating a public and mixed use complex surrounding the harbor of the ex-military arsenal at the Madalena. House of the Seas, a glass, again, glass and glass and glass and basalt prism that cantilevers over the water. Almost 2,000 square meters, the new construction hosts a large event and conference hall suspended six meters above water that looks out towards the extraordinary panorama of the Galura. Uh, it's, it's, it's like the other building. It's very similar, at least from, uh, you know, from, from the air. Uh, the interior, yes, uh, is a little bit different because of the, and I think it's skillfully done in terms of a modernistic language. And I like the fact that uh, some kind of ornamentation is present here, but we cannot in any way pretend to have an ornamentation to compete with the complexities and the beauty of uh, those Islamic ornaments that we saw in, earlier. Well, you know, this is what we look at here is, uh, is uh, the assault of man on nature, on the world, extending himself, man, the measure of all things, you know, even on the water. And do you see trees here? Not too many. They were all cut down, cut down for the so-called human progress. Well, But again, I like this embroidered part of the project, which brings in some sensitivity and uh, I'm, I'm glad he did it. The veiled building, because it, that's what it is. It is a veiled building on this side, at least. And there might be an octagon here too, or at least a hexagon. I, but I think it is a, an octagon. I didn't think of it anyway. Stefano Boeri. He is a skillful architect. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But these cantilever parts are actually an easy way out of uh, other, what otherwise might have been a little, a little bit uh, 
too predictable. Too often now we rely on cantilever part in order to bring some, you know, excitement, so to speak, to the building. My, in my opinion, it's not a very, uh, Louis Kahn didn't have any cantilevers in his uh, DACA complex and his architecture uh, cannot be uh, dismissed as being, um, you know, uh, without uh, interest. Anyway, but again, I welcome the, the return of the ornamentation. Uh, I, uh, and this embroidered part, as I call it, is I think a plus in this project. Now, Stefano Boeri, we are approaching the end. Stefano Boeri completes the new entrance and walk, walkway at Rome's Domus Aurea, <clears throat> where actually there is an octagonal room that was built by the Emperor Nero for himself, <clears throat> which is considered, I read, <clears throat> the most uh, <clears throat> important room from Roman times that is still uh, still exists, and it was um, uh, you know uh, remade. Um, I mean, the structure was there. Too bad I don't have pictures with it here. But this is the project, the intervention of uh, Stefano Boeri. Uh, I like the fact that he is very, is resolutely, you know, modern, is crisp, is uh, is sharp, is even a little bit uh, impertinent. Uh, but uh, I like the dialectics between the cave-like interior and the, you know, the astute uh, uh, geometry uh, of, of of his intervention. So he has inserted an entrance kiosk and pedestrian walkway that provides access to subterranean rooms within Rome's historic Domus Aurea Palace. The new entrance is situated within Opian Hill Park and connects with the whole walkway that leads to the spectacular octagonal room almost six meters below. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, the pictures with that room yet in this presentation anyway. So this is his intervention, just the walkways uh, in, uh, in uh, Domus Aurea. And now I end the presentation on Stefano Boeri with a project he did uh, to design the largest, largest rehabilitation center in Shenzhen in China. Uh, and uh, I'll just read a little bit about it. Architecture firm led by Italian Stefano Boeri has won the competition to build the largest and most innovative rehabilitation center for people with cognitive disabilities or reduced mobility in the Longhua district of the city of Shenzhen, China. Proposal by Stefano Boeri Architetti was selected by a jury whose members included Peter Cook and Su Fujimoto. Located in the southeast of China, the development will be sited next to an urban park and directly connected to the city's light mobility system. Plan to be built in the next three years. This is a very recent uh, project by Stefano Boeri. The project has terraces covered with greenery, with aromatic herbs and healing plants, including workspaces and spaces for educational, recreational, artistic and sports activities, as well as a museum and accommodation. A set of green terraces and overlapping spaces, spaces in a sustainable system combining nature, architecture, and biodiversity, and including internal gardens dedicated to rehabilitation. Here is the building, uh, not a very modest building, but maybe this is good, I don't know. Uh, it is an impressive uh, building, almost expressionistic, although you know the grid of the facade is not uh, uh, you know, easily relatable to uh, expressionists, but the silhouette of the building is, and the dialectics between, you know, almost green, red and, and the green of nature creates an additional uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, dynamic uh, uh, 
dynamic uh, context. China is remarkable, is, is leading the world in the field of architectural innovations. Bravo to them. And they are wise enough to invite architects from all over the world to build there, something we don't do. Why? I don't know. We probably think we have nothing to learn. Anyway, uh, so this is the last image I show from Stefano Boeri. And now I go to the second architect. I only have a few images. He's a, he was a North American architect dedicated to hedonistic understanding of architecture. He was born on, on the 25th of November. So Morris Lapidus, uh, you see born November 25th in 1902 was an architect primarily known for his neo-baroque Miami modern hotels con constructed in the 1950s and 60s, which have since come to define that era's resort hotel style synonymous with Miami and Miami Beach. Well, synonymous with a rich Miami and Miami Beach because Miami also has a lot of poverty. But architects in general do not care too much about that. Zaha Hadid included. Anyway, Maurice Lapidus, here is uh, the man. He doesn't look too happy or too hedonistically oriented, or maybe, you know, he's probably over 90 here. He's tired of too much, he, uh, in this picture, of too much uh, hedonism. And uh, he even, uh, we'll read a statement by him. Here, he looks rather strange. Uh, but um, I, I don't know, he's not at all uh, one of my preferred architects. I'll just show some images um, from his uh, work, which was destined to uh, give people pleasure. Um, but to me, this, this understanding of what pleasure is, uh, is very misleading. You know, the resort hotels, what are the resort hotels? You know, they are escapes escapes for a short while to forget about the essential boredom of your life. Americana, they're the top, you know, rather vulgar. Uh, you know, it's a rather vulgar architecture, but I present him because he was uh, reconsidered somehow uh, uh, at the time when I lived in New York City and I attended, uh, uh, you know, events uh, where his name was mentioned. So I said, let me let me look at, at him a little bit. Uh, it's, yes, it's an architecture of, uh, of pleasure, you know. Uh, people, uh, bored people from other parts of the country or the world would come here, spend their money to have the illusion that they are godlike or narrow like if we are to think of the Emperor Nero, and, and, and Nero in Rome and his uh, octagonal, incredible octagonal room, room which we didn't see. Uh, what is a hotel? You know, it's a space of transitoriness. It's a space of illusions. It's a space of uh, forgetting, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a way, the, 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 the limits, the intrinsic limits of, um, uh, of um, being a human on this earth. I'm beginning to, 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 to feel that perhaps I made a mistake that I included him in this presentation, but now I, I move forward. Um, of all the buildings that I saw, this one is perhaps the only one that uh, I, I, I can, uh, I can uh, accept because it is more abstracted. Uh, of course, it has a lot of glass, but at the time when he built uh, you know, we didn't, uh, he didn't have to deal with um, climate change and sustainability. It has a certain level of abstractness, which I guess is, uh, is, uh, is okay. I don't know about the interior, if you like uh, pop art, I guess the interior as well. But uh, in my opinion, it's a rather vulgar um, expression of what uh, joy on this earth is to be. The architecture of joy. Uh, I discovered actually a Romanian, I don't know, architect or a student or a scholar who wrote about him, about Maurice Lapidus, and, and she 
use this title, The Architecture of Joy. In my opinion, there isn't really such a great joy in what I looked at there, is the appearance of joy. It's certainly not the same world and the same joy that uh, Ode of Joy uh, of Beethoven uh, referred to. So this is what she wrote. Uh, Irina Marinescu in Romania. Nu știu pentru care motiv azi mi-a venit în minte obsesiv numele arhitectului Moris Lapidus, cel mai probabil printr-o asociere de imagini, pentru că arhitectura lui mă duce cu gândul la fata Morgana și la reveriile filmice pe care le am în fiecare vară. So let me translate. I don't know for what reason today I thought of Moris Lapidus, uh, maybe because of a possible association of images, uh, because his architecture uh, makes me think of Fata Morgana and the uh, filmic uh, reveries um, uh, that, that uh, she had, the author of these uh, words uh, in, in each uh, summer. I imagine those, uh, uh, you know, filmic or uh, yeah, uh, reveries were actually uh, Hollywood made. Here he is in the kitchen uh, washing dishes. It is said that in the United States, uh, men wash dishes and not women, but uh, I see she's doing something in the sink rather similar. Anyway, uh, uh, he does seem happy here and she seems to admire him for uh, cleaning up the, the, the dish. My whole success, he says, is I've always been designing for people First, because I wanted to sell them merchandise. I guess he was a merchant at first. Then when I got into hotels, I had to rethink, what am I selling now? You are selling a good time. So this architect, uh, you know, uh, sold people what he called a good time. I'm absolutely sure I would not have bought so-called good time from him. Although this, uh, these uh, steps uh, towards infinity uh, seem to be attractive and uh, obviously not only for me, uh, but what can we say? Is the ocean, is the sky, is the desire for, uh, again, forgetting that life is not just pleasure. And probably Mr. Lapidus didn't know what Leonardo da Vinci said that pain and pleasure are twins and they always come together. Otherwise, this image is rather intriguing. I don't know exactly what these circles mean and what they, they were made for, but this is more of a rather interesting um, architecture. And here we see a little bit of um, you know, melodrama in terms of space and, and, and forms and shape. Why not? And another, you know, uh, good time. <laughs> and around 1960s, uh, Miami Beach architect Maurice Lapidus, whose credits include Miami Beach's Fontainebleau, Fontainebleau and Eden Rock Hotels, was commissioned to redesign Lincoln Road. Lapidus designed for Lincoln Road, complete with gardens, fountains, shelters, architectural follies, shade structures, each shade structure exploits 120th century technology in concrete construction, concrete which pollutes a lot, folded plates, cantilevers, floating slabs, etc., and an amphitheater reflected the Miami modern architecture, or MIMO, or MIMO style that Lapidus pioneered in the 1950s. The road was close to traffic and became one of the nation's first pedestrian malls. And what do we look at here? Lux calme volupte, to use the words of Charles Baudelaire, right? Who said that life is difficult? Who said that life is, uh, uh, you know, uh, full of problems? These people don't seem to have any problem. And Miami welcomed them for as long as there was something in their pockets. That's it.